Okay. Um, is this thing on? I'm going to talk about a little different policy approach. Fundamentally, with the onset of climate change, there's two sorts of things we can do. One thing we can do is to undertake particular activities to reduce future emissions. Biofuels is in that category. So were a number of the other policies that were talked about earlier. But there's another policy approach, and that is that we can try to adapt agriculture or change our production practices. So now it sounds louder. So we we perform in a more satisfactory manner. Now, um, there's a number of reasons why we might want to adjust agriculture to climate change. These are a number of the symptoms that, that are going on if it's warmer we have a greater demand for water on behalf of the plants and on behalf of the cities. And remember, I'm here from Texas where this is a pretty big deal. It's, it's a bit less of a deal here because the projections in Texas are that by 2050 we'll have less water on average than the biggest drought we ever saw, whereas the projections here are it's wetter. So um, my mind is set for a drier climate change scenario, not a wetter one. So we may have more fresh water here. Uh, we may also have more water in infrequent events. Um, there are forecasts of northward shifts in, in storm tracks, so perhaps you'll get the Mississippi storms that just went through rather than those happening in the south. Um, we also expect more pests. We expect altered rates of grass growth. Less severe weather up here, which probably means animals might winter better um, in the far northern parts of Michigan. Northward crop migrations. I mean, we've observed more blueberries in, Tex in Canada over the last couple of years because they get less killing frost. So we've seen things that shift north altered water quality, maybe to the better or to the worse, inundated facilities. I don't think the Great Lakes are forecast to, to rise, but for example, New Orleans grain facilities might have a problem with, with sea level rise. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are a manifestation, higher priced energy. Uh, an earlier lake thaw, there's some people here working on the impact on the cherry industry, I think, of of the lake thawing out sooner and you having more incidents potentially of killing frosts under that. And then winter access to, to water transport, it may be the St. Lawrence is permanently open. Um, so all of these things could happen because of climate change and many of them cause the need for adaptation. Adaptation can be a positive or a negative force we may adapt by planting earlier in order to take account of the fact that it's hotter in the summer and, and the commodities don't grow as well, but by adapting we may actually be able to either compensate for the climate change loss or completely offset it and exploit things that make us more productive afterward than before. And one other factor I guess I don't have here is the CO2 effect. Generally, a lot of commodities, if we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, their growth rates are enriched by that, and therefore they, they get higher yields. And in fact, in the U.S. National Assessment, which I'll show in a minute, the balance for the country is we expect an expansion in production, not a contraction. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two things today. I did the U.S. National Assessment of Climate Change in a number of years ago, a number of years ago, and then I recently did a study on how rates of return to research are affected by the incidence of climate change. Okay, this is the U.S. National Assessment. I bolded the lake states here. Um, what this shows is average weighted national crop yield effects by, I think this was 20, this was probably the, either the 2030 or the 2080 scenario. And notice nationally we expect under climate change a 25% increase under the Hadley climate change scenario, 
a 16% under another one, 6% and 6.5%, the blue line at the bottom. In this area, we expect uniform yield increases. So the, the net effect, without considering pests and things like that for this area, is a positive effect of, of climate change. Also, this area gains in comparative advantage because generally its yields go up at a faster rate than do the nation, does the nation. Um, the other factor is one on returns to research. This means per dollar invested in the experiment station, we call it Texas AgriLife Research in, in Texas. I, is it still the experiment station here? Okay. A dollar invested in the experiment station, how many dollars worth of return would you get from that investment? And what this is showing is nationally, under climate change, we get a slight increase in the rates of return for research in 2020 and 2050, and a slight decrease out in 2100. In Texas, notice we have a 22% hit where climate change is going to lower our returns to research. In this particular area, which is the central area in this graph, we get a 2% hit in 2020 and a percent and a half in 2100, and about a 4% increase now. This shows that people at the experiment station might walk around and say, well, in order to achieve the same rate of technical progress, we need these numbers down at the bottom. I didn't copy in the I didn't copy the right numbers in, but um, we need a 6% reduction in 2020, a 15% increase in 2100. And there was an increase, for this area, you would need to increase research funds in 2020 and 2100, and they'd be a, be a little bit able to be reduced in 2050. So now, in the face of climate change and effects like this, what can we do? Well, when the Bush administration came in in 2000, they said, the science isn't perfect, we're going to wait for more information. So that's obviously the first effect. We're going to wait for more information. And it looks like at the national scale, that's probably the most likely result for the next couple of years. The second thing we can do is plan to adapt, and then the third thing we can do is to pursue mitigation of emissions. I'm going to talk about adaptation principally from now on. Now, the first thing that I want to do, and I won't dance, he can dance, but I'll point. Um, the first thing that I want to look at is what's called the inevitability of adaptation. In 1985, I started doing climate change work. And at that particular point, the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, was about 340 parts per million. Anybody know what it is today? It's, it's right on the edge of being 400. It's 395 or something like that. It's gone up 50 points on a basis of 340 in 25 years. So it's, it's rising fairly rapidly. Well, these are different stabilization targets. This is what happens if, I'll, I'll do this one so I don't have to stand on my tiptoes. If you want to stabilize at 700 parts per million, which is pre-industrial was 275, so we're two and a half times what it was in the 1800s. That will gain you between a three and a four degree centigrade temperature increase. So roughly eight degrees warmer here. You have to peak carbon dioxide emissions globally by about 2050. Right now, they're rising a half a percent per year, and there's no sign of them slowing down. By the end of the century, they have to fall back to 2,000 levels. And in 2050, we have to have basically about a 50% cut in emissions. This isn't going to happen. If we're going to peak at this one, which is 450 parts per million, 
which is the level the Europeans labeled two or three years ago as dangerous climate change interference, we have to peak right now. We have to get back very quickly. This isn't going to happen. My money is that the younger ones in the audience will see at least 700 parts per million with these kinds of consequences. What this means is if we don't have any global action on this, we got to start to adapt. So this is the inevitability of adaptation that I would call it. Um, this is a picture of the emissions, and there's only one thing that I find kind of interesting in this. This is the year 2002, right here. This red bar is China. This blue bar is the United States. Notice here China's about two-thirds the United States in 2002. Anybody know what they were in 2008? They were over 100% of the United States. In a five-year period, they went up by more than 50% in emissions. We're not going to slow this thing down. Energy is very important to economic development. They have a lot of money. They want energy. The BRIC countries are right behind Brazil, India, former Soviet Union. We're likely to have a big increase before we ever see a decrease. This is the other part of this story. This is how much potential carbon there is stored in the ground. And notice oil and natural gas are fairly small, but this gives us the opportunity to put 10 times as much carbon into the atmosphere as there is there now. Again, an inevitability argument. I think long before we get a hold of this thing, um, we're going to put a lot more up into the atmosphere. So, if we're in agriculture, what do we do? Um, a couple years ago, I was engaged by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, to do a global estimate of how much money we'd have to spend in order to adapt to climate change. They gave me a good whole two weeks to do it, so I did an extremely careful scientific job involving dice, coins, and other things. And I had estimate how much it would take for research investment, extension investment, capital uh, investment, and look at you know, a bunch of these kinds of things. I mean, we could develop drought-resistant varieties. We can develop heat-tolerant livestock breeds and varieties. We can shift the crop mix. We can change tree rotation ages. We can abandon land. This is the favorite in Texas. About 25% less cropped acres after climate change than before, and other kinds of things. A lot of people talk about us doing a lot more irrigation, but there's a small problem. You need to have the water. Uh, um, so anyhow, I did that. and. I don't know why, but I got these things kind of out of sequence. Here is, um, this is my cost estimates for doing this. And it basically comes down to we need between five and $13 billion of annual investment in order to adapt for cl to climate change. Five whole minutes, huh? Okay, so, uh, it's a substantial thing, and this is why in Copenhagen, the U.S. and other countries had, uh, agreed to some kind of an adaptation fund. Now, I also did some work in Africa to try to take a look at what the value was of these adaptations. And here, Africa, the country of Mali, is pretty vulnerable to climate change. If you do crop mix, you can offset about 15% of that vulnerability. International trade looks like it can offset 2%. New technologies in various kinds of crop growing can get about 6%. And by the time you get the whole package involved, you can offset about 40% of the cost. Was that risk of hunger or, yeah, no, that's the, the loss in dollars. The point is that there are things we can do to adapt. In areas like this, they may be positive adaptations. I mean, they may, they may be taking something that's, that's making us marginally better and making us way better off. It'd be the same. Well, what seems to be happening here is that 
the, the agricultural environment is changing all this. New pests are moving in, it's getting warmer, more or less variability, etc. This means we're going to have to do maintenance research. We're used to that in the experiment station on pests, because every three years the pests develop a new genotype or get some resistance or whatever. But I think we're going to have to do that on a number of agronomic things. So we're going to need greater investments in research and extension because of the effect of climate change to maintain where we are, not only to improve, but even to sort of stay in place. Uh, what do we know about adaptation? Well, there's three, there's three big things. There's changing in management earlier planting, changing the stocking rates, pest treatments, and this could be enhancing a positive opportunity. Then there's importing southern crop mixes, so more corn in Michigan, um, and bringing in heat resistant varieties and perhaps substituting crops, livestock, and forests. And then there's investment, research and extension, moving infrastructure, transport, and some of this will occur due to obsolescence. What I mean by moving infrastructure is if now the Canadians can grow a bunch of blueberries, they need to build blueberry processing plants up in Canada. In, in um, Norway, they're moving fish production from the south to the north of the country. Well, they got to move roads, infrastructure, processing, air, airports, etc. Now, because climate change comes on fairly slowly and we replace farm equipment every 10 years, a good amount of this investment is going to happen sort of autonomously without a lot of need for external energy. Uh, we also, we do know that we, or we don't know what's going to happen in response to increased variability, earlier thaws, the the ability of the industry to invest. If it gets wetter here, we have more water logging problems. I would think you would. What about more extreme events? What if you get the tornadoes? Um, and what about pests, invasive species, and disease? And then finally, before I'm told to get off the stage, I got this from a graduate student yesterday. Uh, there's this model that Bill Nordhaus has at Yale, which is called the DICE model. It's sort of the way that we do our climate change revolt does. Um, anyhow, this has two pictures in it, two lines in it. This line down here, this little blue one, is the investment in adaptation. This little pinkish one is the investment in mitigation. And what this little graph that she just sent me yesterday tells me is forget about what those guys were talking about. The mitigation investment lags the adaptation investment until 2130. What we need to do is get on with investing in, in adaptation because in the near term investments in mitigation, while they have a longer term payoff, cost a lot of money now and don't return until the magnitude of the damages gets higher. So the cold-blooded economist says, forget about carbon footprint. Let's start investing some money in adaptation. So with that, I will stop. If all of a sudden 
Uh, I mean, one of the statistics in climate change shows a 25% increase, roughly, in the amount of rain coming in severe storms as opposed to general frontal rain. So now you're getting much more water from thunderstorms than you used to get from occasional rains. If that's the case, we need new water management strategies. We need furrow diking. We need to maybe build little impoundments. We need things like that. And that isn't going to disseminate easily because it's not a historical practice in the area. So we need the investment or the extension service part of technology dissemination because some people are facing changing um, environment that they didn't use to face. Now, how that investment is going to be made in, in Texas, you know, we keep taking money away from the extension service. Um, on the other hand, in Texas, abandonment of land is one thing they probably can figure out how to do. Um, so maybe we don't need as much extension investment. But I think nationally, we need to make the case that this is it's going to take investment for us to better adapt, and it's something we better get started on. I haven't heard anybody much argument. Uh, maybe other people have, but I haven't. Um, I'm just curious whether mitigation and adaptation have to be mutually exclusive, or whether there are some, some things that overlap and, and handle both at the same time. Well, notice they are exclusive here and that they're both happening simultaneously. But this is a relatively complex issue because in some ways they're competitive because adaptation or mitigation using biofuels takes land from traditional production and puts it into biofuels. Northward shifts of crop mixes takes land that was doing something else down here and moves that land use up there. Both of them tend possibly to use more crops. The other part of the story I didn't tell is at the same time, the US is supposed to go up at one third in population. So we're also going to have to adapt to that bigger population with, with enhanced food production. So there's, there are complementary aspects and there are substitute aspects of the issue. And it's a real careful balancing act. It's much like we've learned in corn biofuels. I mean, 10 years ago, if you walked around here, everybody would say corn biofuels is great. Today, it's a little bit more complicated of a picture, and we just need to very carefully evaluate that. And mitigation and carbon cap and trade, or, or, or adaptation and cap and trade, are exactly in the same area. Okay, uh, this is, uh, thank you very much.